Good morning, everybody. This is Peter Hernandez. This is the Friday Morning Drive. This is the call that started them all. That's part of the Douglas Element podcast series. You can find our calls on iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud. They're uploaded there every time, unless they're like personal to the company. If they're exclusive to the agents, you can find them on uh, Douglas. They'll be listed there. But the public calls like this one with Ernie will go up on the uh, on the uh, iPodcast uh, podcast. So good morning. Good morning, Ernie. How are you, partner? Doing good. I just came in from an hour long health walk, got showered and ready for this call to talk to you and everyone. I'm all ready to go and to start the second half of 22. Today is the first day of the next six months. That is correct. So for those that you don't know Ernie Carswell, uh, he's one of our absolute top agents in Beverly Hills. Uh, I've known him for years. We go back to John Douglas Company, which many of you have never even heard of. And, you know, we have worked together through all these years and we were the founding partners for TELUS Properties. And uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but to, on the 7th of August, we'll be celebrating five years from uh, the day that Douglas Elliman acquired a CERNI. And I know for you, that was a very, very happy day because you actually worked at Douglas Elliman before, didn't you? That's right. It was returning home to Douglas Elliman, where I was a Manhattan broker in the 80s. Um, so I just love the whole loop of my career life and how in New York it started with Douglas Elliman. And now here we are in Beverly Hills back together again. So Ernie and I were like talking about, um, you know, what we should talk about today. And, you know, we're always challenged to kind of reach this bar Ernie set with his call on how to show a property. And if you haven't listened to that call, you have to go on to iTunes or SoundClouds and actually, I mean, seriously, Ernie, they have to go in and listen to that call because he takes what some people would think is just a mundane event and makes it a very, very strategic activity. So we were kind of like kicking around ideas going, what could we do similar, you know, to help agents maybe develop strategies around things that seem simple, but Ernie, they really aren't, are they? I mean, everything has to be thoughtful. Our business is a detail business and it begins at showing a property if we're working with buyers or if we're the listing agent and it continues through negotiations. It is a nuanced career. And the problem with many people entering our ranks, Peter, is they've not learned the nuances in communication and corresponding with potential clients or how to show a house in a nuanced way and, and get the deal. And that's what we hope to help educate them to learn. Absolutely. So what we decided we were gonna focus on was presenting the offer in the, new, in the new world. Because Ernie, how did we used to do it? Oh man, Peter, as you remember, uh, <laughs> we'll admit before there was an internet, but we'll even admit before there were fax machines, when, when we as agents had an offer for a property, first of all, they were handwritten and we took them to the seller, sat in their living room and delivered the offer in person, brought the comps, brought whatever points to negotiate were important. And it was a very personal, direct interaction between agent with offer and seller. And it gave us a lot more control. We were able to control the narrative we were able to really express our clients' needs. And that kind of went out the window all of a sudden. Now yeah. we're just emailing offers that we don't know what's happening with them. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes and we're really at a disadvantage. But before we get to that, I think the important conversation and what's on everybody's mind right now, Ernie, is how do I get an offer right now with all this nonsense and noise and everything going on in, the, in our community, not only locally, but globally? How do we get people to write right now? Well, the only buyers I know that are hesitating to write because there's, a, there's still a great demand out there in our market, Peter, thank the Lord for that. But the only buyers that are hesitating to write are the ones that are trying to time the market. And so our first lesson and our first general rule in real estate is no one can time the market. I mean, whole careers are made in Wall, on Wall Street, those, you know, brilliant minds in the financial world trying to time the stock market. None of them have figured out how to do it. It's impossible. And you certainly cannot time the real estate market, which moves slower than the stock market activity. So the first thing you must do 
when you have a resistant buyer, most likely you ask them, do you think it's going to be better to wait to write an offer on this house that you like? So find out if they believe it's better to wait because you've got to knock down that theory. And the way to knock it down is first, just say throughout real estate history, it's been proven it's impossible to time the market. Some people get lucky, but those who try to time the market 95% or more of the time lose because while you think you're getting a better price by waiting six months, which may be true, what you don't know about coming is, you know, the earthquake <laughs> or another terrible uh, tragic event that happens on a national level. Things that are not even timed to real estate cycles, but the uncertainty of fate that inevitably steps into all of our lives. So waiting is never the answer. You must counsel that buyer, find out if they think waiting will get them a better price and then help convince them but you're not counting on everything else in life that happens that you cannot even imagine will occur that may hurt your plan on getting a better price, but then you're unable to buy, period. So how is that going to help you? That's the way I work from it. I, and I like that, Ernie. And there's been many times throughout history in our, in our long careers that we've seen governments take actions, things happen that we didn't think was going to happen, <laughs> actually took a market that we thought was going to go down, turn it around almost on the spot. Now it's going up again. So I don't see how you can time the market, predict the market or anything like that. And the other thing we talked about too, Ernie, was what if that's the house they want? Are they going to risk that that house is available when they want to, when they want to buy? Right, exactly. Look, Peter, another thing, without us sounding like the sages in the room, We've been at these market transitions before. We were there in 2007, 2008. In fact, that's when we founded Telus Properties. If we were trying to time the market, we would have never opened a company at that time, right? It would, right, it would have right. sounded logical. And yet it succeeded. And now we're Douglas Elliman. So we were smart because we didn't try to time the market. We had a vision and a goal and something we wanted to achieve and we put forth and that's what a serious buyer should do when they find a house that they're emotionally charged about. Waiting for the market is not smart. But, um, you know, I was in a seminar yesterday that Jared on my team organized to hear Chris Boss speak. Um, and Michelle Moses went with me as well. And he has a great technique when he's helped unlock hostage situations. He's notorious on, in America for being a hostage negotiator and, and getting people out of that terrible danger when they're held hostage and talking to the perpetrators. But he says, ask a no question. And that got my attention. I thought, what's a no question? So to unlock a buyer who's resistant to writing an offer, instead of trying to ask them a question to get a yes, ask them a question that they must answer no. And statistics show 27% of the time, if you get a no answer from the other side, you're going to come to a quicker resolution. This is scientific and analysis of you know, hostage negotiations. So uh, an example of this no question is one I posed a few minutes earlier. Do you believe that waiting six months will help you get this house? Most likely they're going to say no. They may answer something else about, well, the price will be lower, but you're going to be able to find out if you can get them to a question that you've asked that they must answer no to of turning them around. It's a little more involved in that. And I'm not Chris Voss and the great guru that he is, but um, I, I was listening carefully yesterday and I'm going to start asking more questions that I know are going to get a return no answer from my other party so that we can move the conversation toward a resolution in the direction I'd like it to go. Um, one more question for you, and then we can move on to how to present the offer after we get the offer. But the question I'd ask you is this, Ernie, you have a client, they say, let's say the house is listed for $2 million. And they say, gosh, Ernie, you know, I just think $2 million is too much. I'm just not waiting to pay that much. What do you do with that question and how do you get them to write? I hear you. And if $2 million is really too much for that property, do you want to let this one go? They may answer no. That's what we're hoping for. So then you've got something to work with. If they say yes, 
then you've got to turn around and find another property. And look, that's some of the travails of what we do as real estate agents. We know we've guided the buyer to the best possible house for them. They like it and they're unwilling to make a move on it. It's a critical moment. If you cannot encourage them to buy the house, try not to time the market, get them to answer a question that will reveal a no from them so that you can turn their mindset around, then move on and find another house or decide if you want to continue working with that buyer because you know we only have our time to sell and to benefit from client interaction. Okay. We got the offer Ernie. They 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 wrote you did it, man. We didn't we got the no we wanted. What do you th- what are the secrets right now and, and and what's the strategies that you employ you personally with your team to get the offer accepted? All right, so I'm telling uh Secret recipes here, but I'm going to share this. Anyone that's worked on my team knows this principle that I have. Never, ever submit an offer, ever, ever, via email or text or however, or drop it off at someone's office unless you have at least the listing agent on the phone. I will not submit an offer unless that listing agent is on a call with me. And when they answer and say hello, I hit the send key. It's a psychological reason. First of all, especially if you're in multiples and you're you're representing a buyer and you know that there are other offers, you've got to have the contact and you've got to have at least a few minutes to present your case and your buyer to that listing agent. Do not let this become a robotic automated process. You're absolutely more likely to lose. You have faulted your buyer and not presented their case You know, if we were in the courtroom, that your client would expect you to stand up before the judge and advocate for them. That's what we're expected to do as real estate agents, advocate for our buyers, our clients. So I don't just send an offer. I have a conversation with the listing agent. Um, Sometimes I ask for a conference call with the the seller, you know, um, and try to get, you know, a, a telephone presentation. But you do not email offers without having a personal contact with at least the listing representative. I love that. That is, that is a really, really good new strategy since we can't sit in the living room anymore as a rule. I love that. All right. So now you've, you've got the agent on the line, you hit send. This is, this is what everybody needs to know. What are the questions you ask? Oh, yeah, I've got the first question, but I just want to go back because I saw someone on the chat line. Here's the here's the, here's how specific I am about the way to call with that offer. Do not send the offer and then dial the agent. Cannot do that. You dial the agent, have your finger on the send button. And when they say hello, hit send and say, I just sent you the offer. You lose all your power if you do it any other way. So keep your power as the buyer's agent. Now. When you get the listing agent on that phone call to answer your question, Peter, the single most important question to ask at the beginning of the conversation, after you've said your niceties to build rapport with that listing agent, who's going to have some control in the decision, just admit that they're going to control it, whether they admit it or not. Um, Do you or does anyone on your team have a buyer for this property? How often agents forget to ask that and then find out whether it's multiples or even it doesn't become multiples, but you just find out, oh, it just sold to someone else because the listing agent had a buyer or the listing agent's team member had a buyer. You know you're at a disadvantage if you represent a buyer and the listing agent has their own buyer. We all know that. So you must find that out first on the phone call in a very genteel diplomatic way. I'm just getting this out of the way to ask, do you or or does anyone on your team have a buyer for this property? Most of the time you're going to get the answer no. And then you proceed with your presentation. You have to change your strategy if they say yes, because you've just gotten the news you really don't want to hear, but it's good that you know going in. And what I do is I say, I'm glad you told me that. I'd like to go back and tell my buyer because this offer was created without us knowing that the listing agent has their own buyer. And I think my buyer needs to know that. We might want to reformulate some of our terms. 
what is that agent going to say? No, you can't wait. I mean, that's what I would do because you've got to go back to your buyer and say, okay, we've got a little extra competition because the listing agent has their own buyer. Um, the deck is a little stacked in their favor. We need to sweeten our deal somehow. Just be honest with them. Most of the time you'll still prevail. And I celebrate my agents on the team when that happens and they follow this direction. I had an agent this week that didn't ask that question and then came very sorrowfully to my office and said, we were the leading people in the multiple offers. And then we just found out we didn't get the deal and the listing agent had a buyer and they had not asked the question. So you've got to ask that question. I think that's a great question. And what about, I was thinking of two other scenarios that we have to watch out for. When the agent has a friend in the industry, another broker with the with an offer and it's their friend. Yeah. Have you thought of that one? Oh, I thought about it and I've been in those situations. <laughs> you want to you know, be the friend, don't you? Yeah. Is anybody getting the indication that we are in a complex negotiating circle when we deliver offers and there may be multiples? This is not for the faint of heart or for the inexperienced. So the first thing I say to all agents, which is why many of them like the idea of being on a team or the wonderful education programs that Douglas Elliman provides and the seminars to just support knowledge in this complex environment that we oper operate in, you've got to have multi-layered thinking when you begin to negotiate a deal. Anything can happen. Legal problems come up, non-disclosure from one or more parties. There may be agents that have been pawned off and referred a buyer that, you know, is not technically the listing agent, but they're still getting some sort of, you know, referral feedback. There, it's just a very complex uh, round table. So I am very strategic and I just encourage all newer agents in the business to learn strategies, learn strategic thinking um, to negotiate because it's not just, oh, here's our order. Uh, hope you like it. You've got to get in there and have the difficult discussions. And another question to ask the listing agent, Peter, when you get them on the phone and they say, no, I don't have any buyers for the property. You want to be sure that you reach across the table. And this is a mistake many agents do not uh, often make, and they don't realize the importance of not making this mistake. You must reach across the table and build rapport with that listing agent, even if you basically don't like them. Because the listing agent, as the direct ear of the seller, and you need that listing agent advocating for your client, your buyer. So you start kissing some behind. You know what I mean? You need to be very diplomatic and spend a moment on building them up, talk about how nice their career is, you know, fill their head with compliments, whatever. You must build rapport with the listing agent. Coming into that room, you want that agent liking you and your buyer. That's going to help you. 100%, 100%. Agents have to just feel you're their best friend and you admire them and respect them and how much you're looking forward to work for them. So, so as you're asking these very, very touchy questions, because you know, just whether or not they have their own buyer isn't the only touchy question you're going to be asking. You're going to dig a little deeper, like what's the yeah. seller going to accept? What should I write? You're going to ask more questions like that that Ernie can share with you. So as you ask these potentially confronting questions, Ernie, your goal is to be, and you said this to me, and I love this, you want to be the broker's broker. What do you mean by this? I'm going to tell you right now what I often say. You can copy me if you want. I say to that listing agent, I want to be your escrow partner on this property. What can I do to partner with you so that our clients get together here? I build that bridge and I start saying, I want to partner with you. I make it about the agent not the property of their client. I wanna make that listing agent feel powerful and feel like they've got a lot of control because they're gonna like having control of the conversation even though I'm giving it to them. You see what I'm saying? That's the complexity of my strategic thought and what I'm trying to encourage everyone to think about. Don't just be an order taker and then a delivery, uh, you know, like a mailman delivering the offer. You're gonna lose. Or at, at best, you're just gonna have no say in anything. Build a relationship with that other agent. It will always serve you and your clients well. You made me just think we're not delivering pizza. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Extra cheese, please. Extra cheese. Exactly. 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 
All right, so so you're you're building your rapport, you're building this 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 uh, this this bridge, so to speak. I think you called it um, with the with the with the other agent. What are the some of the things you're trying to get across to give them the confidence to accept your offer? Look, what I stay away from early in the conversation is trying to get to the sticky question of what is it going to take because that's what we all want to know, right? And that's what the listing agent may be trying to hold back on. The listing agent may know or the listing agent may not know. So don't start there. That's just too, too clumsy to start into the money, build the rapport, and then say, I'd like to know a little bit more about the sellers if you're able to share with me, because if I know more about what your sellers are thinking and why this is on the market, then I'm going to be able to help you make this deal as partners with you. You see, that's the way I speak to them. And by being very conciliatory, often they'll start revealing things to me that they may not tell other agents that call, right? Because I'm giving them a trusted environment that we're partners and I want to help make this deal happen together. So I want to know what the mindset of the seller is. I, I usually try to ask how long have you known them or worked with them, you know, and I relate with, you know, how long I've known my buyers. I've just met them, but they seem to be wonderful people. We pre-qualify. I've known them for 20 years. But all of that rapport building with the other agent. And what they don't realize is I've already started to negotiate because I'm listening to what they're saying, calculating, okay, how's that going to work with what my buyer is willing to do? And if they ask me, what's your buyer willing to pay? I often say, I'm not sure, but if we keep working together, I'm sure it's going to become more obvious to me and I'll help you out. <laughs> you know, things yeah. like that. Sure. I love that. You know, one thing we learned from John Douglas, um, Ernie, and I think it's something that you took to heart and probably do even better than he did. And that is prepare. He used to say, prepare, prepare, prepare. So when you're getting ready to prepare to present your offer, can you take us through that process? Because you do this, whether it's a listing presentation, a showing, whether it's presenting an offer, whatever it is, Ernie, you don't just wing it. You prepare and you plan. Talk about that a little bit. Maybe you have even a series of things you check off as you think about it. I don't know, because I would love to learn myself. Look, it begins with daily market knowledge. Every agent listening on this call has the responsibility to themselves, their career, and their clients to know the market data every day. There's a hot sheet that comes out, the MLS. There are newsreels that come out about trends in, in the housing market. You are failing in this career if you're not in front of the news and in front of the market knowledge, the new houses that hit the neighborhood that you're working. You've got to have the information. So you're always prepared for that surprise phone call. So that's one thing that's a basic bedrock principle that I adhere to. And I know my agents on my team do. And we're constantly sharing knowledge and staying on the front end of the news. But then before a specific appointment, we go deeper. We go into the specifics of that house, neighborhood, location. We look at trends. I, you know, obviously the MLS is a great um, warehouse of information and it's, it's so essential to us, but I get creative at looking at other um, platforms of where, where valuations may be talked about, you know, real trends, um, other new sources, housing wire, whatever, and, and look at that. Because if the comps aren't going to help me for the appointment, in other words, if I know my seller is going to want too much per the MLS comps, maybe the trends that are happening in the headlines of news will be more helpful. Because saying like yesterday's LA Times headline about, yes, prices are going to now start softening. It's in black and white. <laughs> so if I've got comps that aren't helping me to say that to a seller at today's listing appointment that I'm going to be on at 10, 15, then I'm going to say the comps are six months old. And this is no longer February 22. This is July 22. And we've had a rapid change in our real estate market behavior. So I'm sorry the comps in the MLS are not confirming what I believe the real price for your property is. But look at the headlines because it's, these are the forecast of where it's headed. We can still capture a great price for you, but we've got to be market savvy. So that kind of preparation um, is important. Also, you know, I drive by the houses. A lot of times I get calls about homes that I've never been to the house. 
and I'm expected to go sit and talk to them about their listing. So I, if I can't go drive by it and at least do a curb appraisal and do all the online research, uh, I Google map it, I check everything. I, you must be prepared, like you said, John Douglas used to say. So I, I wanna have that confident poise when I enter a meeting and I've memorized my numbers, I've memorized the important statistics. I'm not fumbling around with papers and referring back. I'm just looking them in the eye, feeling very confident and poised because what sellers want and what buyers want is to work with a real estate agent that has confidence and gives answers to questions that are legitimately asked. You know, we can't predict future uh, and, and give exact numbers sometimes, but at least be confident in the way we deliver what we say. And I think that's a big part of success for every top agent I meet out there. And there's a lot of different successful agents that we all know in Beverly Hills and Newport Beach and wherever else someone may be listening to this call from, but they all have one thing in common. On an appointment, they exude confidence. Whether they're prepared or not, they are confident in their abilities. And so to help me be prepared uh, and conf I'm sorry, to help me be confident, I always have to prepare. So I love that, um, Ernie. And knowing values, I mean, I've never once seen you actually bring paper versions of the comps. You've not only studied them, but you've internalized them, memorized them. And like you say, you can look at the client right in the eye and talk from detail without looking at paper, shuffling stuff around, stuff like that. You know, for a lot of us, you guys, you know, we're prepared because we've been preparing our whole lives. You know, we have years and years in the industry. For those of you that are newer, and I'm saying under 10 years, you've got to study the market like you were doing a thesis at, for a master's in college. You have to know the market that well. You have to have copious notes. You've got to call the brokers and ask them why it sold for that price. What happened? Who was the buyer? This is what Ernie's talking about, because when I'm with Ernie on an appointment, he's saying this person bought it. The seller was in trouble. That's why they got this price. I mean, things like this is the anecdotal information around the actual numbers that you could just pull off that becomes so key and critical. Ernie, you've got the values down. You've got that. What else do you do to prepare for the appointment? I decide who to take with me. Um, I, I, sometimes I know it's going to be most potent and best for just to be me. But it's better often to take others with you. I know that Sally Forster Jones shows up at her listing appointments with five or six people on her team. Five or six people. That's like a, a crowd, right? I don't do that. But I like to take one or two people with me, whether it's one of my uh, staff administrative experts, um, another agent on my team. I think it's important to show, you know, support and that there's camaraderie and that you're not just a lone ranger out there. Um, so I, I think that's one thing I take. I, you know, Peter, you've been with me on some listing appointments. Sometimes I take a special gift, you know, not to be too ingratiating, but you remember one time I brought in Newport Beach a grab bag, I had a candle in there, maybe a baseball cap. I don't, it can sound cheesy, but I don't think what you remember, Ernie, and you tell me if you did this on person or not, be honest with me on purpose or not. You had your marketing materials coming out the top of the bag, almost like, like it was unorganized and didn't fit, but then it would be a natural thing for the seller's eye to draw to. Was that on purpose? Probably, yeah, because I think about those details. Yeah, yeah. But you remember how delighted they were. It yeah. could have gone the other way. They were tickled with the little gift or so. And then we talked about the marketing presentation. But the point is, I don't want our agents, and I don't, go into a meeting with you know a, a presentation booklet and lay it on the table and expect the sellers to start looking through it. You're going to lose if you think that no one has the attention span anymore to look through your booklet. You better have it memorized. And what I do is I talk about it and then I leave it with them. And I tell them what I've talked about is here in this book with you for you and some more details about how I market in our extensive networks around the world and all that. But you've got just short attention spans now with clients because everybody's on their phone constantly. There's just terrible short time that you've got to make the impact. So don't expect people to look through your book. Just don't do it. You can have a book, 
but leave it for them after you leave. So they'll remember your, your talk better, but you've got to have it. See, this is what, this is about you guys. You guys, I mean, a lot of our business is very similar to acting and actors have to know their scripts and know their presentation so well that it sounds natural. Memorized, but very, very natural. It has to be completely internalized. Ernie, you're a master at this. Somebody wrote in here just now, this was a master's class. And that's because you are a master, buddy. You are the best. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for coming on today. You guys, we were so lucky to just have Ernie on this call with us. You know, a half hour to him is probably a thousand bucks. So we thank you so much, Ernie, for being with us. I love you so much. You've been a great partner over the years. Um, continued success, my man. I love you. Everybody here, have a great, great Friday, a great weekend. Thank you, Ernie. That was a master's class. Happy fourth, everyone. Thank you, Peter.